today as we continue the journey of Lent is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. Hear the word of the Lord from Mark 4, 35 to 41. That day, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's join our hearts in prayer. God, as we study and wrestle with your word, we pray that you would proclaim to each of us in numerous ways, do not be afraid. God, may the good news of a Savior meet each of us in our fears and our anxieties and declare the hope of victory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, for those of you who were not able to be here last week, or for those of you who are visiting with us today, uh, last week Sunday was the first Sunday of the season of Lent, uh, which is the 40-day period leading up uh, to Easter Sunday. And so last week Sunday, we began a new sermon series. And traditionally, uh, during Lent, Christians often will study the life of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, the passion narratives of Jesus, uh, as a way of preparing for and anticipating resurrection. And so what we are going to do this, uh, this season of Lent is look at gospel stories about Jesus, yes, uh, but those stories in the gospels that are related to fear. Fear is a theme that we see throughout the gospel stories, and fear is especially a theme when it comes to the resurrection stories. And so as we look forward to celebrating resurrection on Easter Sunday, we're going to be looking at various gospel stories that deal with fear fear. Today, then, we are going to begin where we began last week on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. So this is the Sea of Galilee, and as you can hopefully kind of see from the picture, that in comparison to like the Great Lakes, uh, the Sea of Galilee is really not very big. It's 13 miles long by 9 miles Wide, excuse me, eight miles wide. And so the Sea of Galilee is about the size of Washington, D.C. One of the interesting things about the Sea of Galilee is that it is only about 200 feet deep. And in addition to that, it is below sea level. This gets really, really interesting in the fact that you, around the Sea of Galilee, as you can see in the picture, the Sea of Galilee has many hills surrounding it. So given the fact that it's below sea level, it's not very deep, and that it has hills around it mean that the Sea of Galilee is very susceptible to violent and to sudden storms. Despite this, it is Jesus, as we saw at the beginning of our story, it is Jesus who says to his disciples in verse 35, let's go over to the other side. And so here goes the story. The disciples sail off at night for some reason. 
And this uh, storm comes up out of nowhere, and they get really, really scared. And as we know, they wake Jesus up, and Jesus calms the storm. And what I want us to see this morning is what we typically do with this story and with this miracle as Bible-believing Christians. We typically say to ourselves as Bible-believing Christians, hey, this is a really, really neat miracle that Jesus does. What a great story. Many of us don't doubt the truth of this story and that it actually happened. However, we do not give much thought to what this miracle, miracle actually means. And we assume that this story has basically nothing to do with us except that maybe sometimes we can have a lack of faith like the disciples. And so we need to ask ourselves this morning as we study this story together, why does Jesus calm the storm? And why is this story in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke? What is so important about this story. And with many other passages of Scripture, there is so much going on in this story that we may not realize. And so what happens in these seven short verses I wanted to see today is much more than some really neat miracle. And so there are a few things about the story that I want to point out to us today that we point about the story that we might often miss. Number one, the disciples get angry at Jesus at his apparent lack of concern. This furious storm comes up and Jesus, this is such an interesting picture to be. You got a little boat on the Sea of Galilee. There's a storm. I don't know how many of you have been in like a canoe because uh, these, these boats were not very big. I, I don't know if, how many of you have been in a canoe in, in really big swells. Are you able to sleep in something like that? No. You are not. And yet, for some reason, here Jesus is. He's asleep. And Mark sees the need to share with us that Jesus is asleep on a cushion. Jesus is asleep, and the, the disciples go to Jesus. And I want to ask you this morning, how do, this, this, how do the disciples address Jesus? What do they call him? Teacher. Teacher. Rabbi. Don't you care if we drown? They're not asking him to do anything. They're just confused about why he is asleep while this storm is going on. And they cry out to their teacher, Jesus, don't you care about us at all? Do we matter so little to you that you are asleep while our lives are in danger? Number two. After Jesus calms the storm, the disciples... Fear grows. This to me is the most significant part about the story, perhaps much more important than the miracle itself. The disciples are in a huge storm. They've got waves crashing over the side of the boat. They think their boat is going to, to sink. Remember, these people don't know how to swim. There were no swimming lessons. Their lives are in danger. They are wondering if they are going to live or or die. And all of a sudden, they are safe. They are out of danger. They are no, their lives are no longer in jeopardy. And what happens? Verse 41. They go from being afraid to being absolutely terrified. Verse 41. They are not excited to be safe. They are not excited to see what it is that Jesus can do. They are not happy to know that they have a friend who is capable of doing what He did. They are not happy about this. They are terrified. Their lives are no longer in danger. Why is it that they are afraid? They are more afraid after the storm than during the storms. They are safe, but they are more afraid. Number three, disciples realize that they don't really know who Jesus is. In verse 41, at the end of the story, they ask this huge and yet short three-word question, who is this? 
This isn't just about being blown away by the power of Jesus. They're realizing in this moment that they have misunderstood Jesus' identity. They have left everything to follow this rabbi. They had been listening to his parables. They had saw him do some neat miracles. They thought they knew who this guy was. And in verse 41, they're all looking at each other as, as, as the disciples of Jesus, and they're asking each other in terror, who is this guy? Related to this, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that these disciples were Jewish people, and as good Jewish people, they were familiar with the Psalms. The Psalms were something that they used often in worship. And it just so happens that there are a number of Psalms that speak exactly about what is happening in this story. Psalm 65, Psalm 89, Psalm 93, and Psalm 107, they all talk about God bringing calm and stillness to the waters. The language of these psalms is about the Creator God, Yahweh Himself, calming the water and stilling the seas. Again, the disciples, as good Jewish people, they knew these words, and they knew these words were about God. And here's a man a human being right in front of them doing these very things. And so they would have been making these connections between the Psalms and what the Psalms are describing about the Creator God. And here they are seeing a man who is doing these very things. In Mark chapter 4, these connections are being made. And so the disciples are now asking each other, Who is this? This guy is not who we thought he was. A mere teacher, a mere rabbi does not have this kind of power. The disciples are getting their first taste that this guy that they have been following is not merely some guy that God sent. He's not merely a teacher. But that this is God Himself in the flesh. For the disciples, these Jewish people, calming the seas doesn't merely reveal Jesus to be a miracle worker who had some neat powers. This story is about them beginning to realize that Yahweh Himself is in their midst. Now, what does this story, this old story, have to do with us? In addition to being a true story about the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, this story is clearly a metaphor for the storms that we as human beings face in life. We are disciples, many of us here this morning, we are disciples of Jesus as well. And so we, with the disciples, we're in the boat with Jesus. We're following Him. We're going to where He calls. We're learning about Him. We're on this journey with Jesus. We're doing these things with Him. And then this storm comes up out of nowhere. And we as his disciples were afraid, we're scared, we don't don't know what to do. And so we look to Jesus, our teacher, our rabbi. Where is he? He's asleep on a cushion. He is not where we want him to be. He is not doing what we want him to do. And as disciples of Jesus, we want to say to him, Jesus, how can you do this? How can you just let these storms exist? Can't you hear my cries for help? Don't you care about me at all? Don't you care about these storms and these struggles that are happening? Jesus, how can you just lay there? So often, we as human beings, we get mad at Jesus. We get mad at God. Because he's not calling the storms that we experience. We don't understand how he can just sit there. How can he just let us experience all this fear and all this terror and uncertainty? He doesn't seem to care. When we look at the mass shooting that just happened, we want to say to Jesus, why didn't you stop that? So often we ask God, 
where are you? Whether it's mass shootings, the loss of a job, being in financial trouble, family troubles, marital troubles, maybe we're here this morning and we're experiencing grief and loss. Maybe many of you here today are experiencing a great storm in life that is terrifying to you. And as disciples, we want to say to Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? And how does Jesus in this story respond? Yes, he calms the storm, but he looks at his disciples, those who are in the boat with him, and he asks them very, very directly, why are you still so afraid? Do you have no faith? In Mark chapter 4, Why are the disciples afraid? Is it just because of the storm? Well, no, we made note already that no, they're not just afraid during the storm, they're afraid after the storm. And I want to submit to you this morning that the disciples are afraid during the storm and after the storm for the exact same reason. They did not really know who Jesus was. They didn't fully grasp his identity and his power. They thought they knew who Jesus was. They thought they understood that he was a great rabbi, a great teacher, that he clearly was sent by God to do some amazing things. But they realized because of this storm that they were misunderstanding who this guy really was. There's a big part of me that wishes this story was a little bit more helpful in terms of understanding what to do when the storms of life come. I wish this story would give us more direction and more guidance as human beings about what to do when we endure the storms of life. Who doesn't want more information about what it is that we should do when life gets stormy? But this story doesn't give us a lot. This story does not promise, it does not guarantee us that Jesus will indeed quiet the storms of our lives. That's not what this story is teaching us. The story is about Jesus and about who Jesus is and what he is capable of doing. And this story meets us as disciples in whatever storms we may be experiencing and and it asks us a very important question. Do we, do you, misunderstand who Jesus is? Once again, I think the most interesting part about this story is that the disciples get afraid after The storm, after they are safe, after their lives are no longer in danger. Is it possible that the disciples were so afraid during the storm and after the storm because of their confusion about who Jesus is? Is it possible that the disciples were so afraid during the storm, at least in part because they didn't fully recognize or understand Jesus' power over the storm? What do the disciples, once again, what do the disciples call Jesus when they wake him up? Say it again. Teacher. In their minds, he was just that. He was only a teacher. Only a rabbi. They did not yet see him as God, as Lord, and as king. They did not see him as somebody who truly had power over the storm. And this story meets us today and it asks us, do we share the disciples' confusion about Jesus? Is it possible that we don't have a big enough, a powerful enough perspective of who Jesus is and what he is capable of doing? 
to each of us here today. Is Jesus merely a teacher? Is he just some other guy who had had a big impact in human history? Is he merely a neat guy who had some really great things that he said? doesn't matter if we've been in the church our whole lives or we're brand new to the faith. It's important that we ask ourselves today, do we misunderstand who Jesus is? Do we see him as not being all that powerful? Because it's clear in the story that the disciples merely saw Jesus as a great teacher who could do some really great things, who attracted crowds of people. Perhaps they even saw him as a friend. But they did not have a very big view of who he was and what he was capable of doing. They didn't see him as being that powerful. Which is why they ask each other, And why we need to ask each other today, who is this? So much of faith comes down to this little three-word question. Who is Jesus? In our heads, is Jesus merely a friend of ours? Just another teacher, an important historical figure. Is he merely a guy who could do some neat miracles? Is he a psychological guru? Is he a social justice advocate? Is he a political rebel? Who is Jesus to you? And is it possible that your view of who Jesus is and what he is capable of doing is not big enough. This is what the disciples lacked, and this is what perhaps many of us here today lack as well. The ability, when we experience the storms of life, when we experience fear and anxiety and suffering and pain, are we able to affirm in our heads and in our hearts, yes, Jesus, what I'm experiencing is scary and terrifying, it's painful, but... Jesus, I believe your power is greater. Jesus, I believe that you are not merely my friend, but that you are the God who created the heavens and the earth. That I believe that you are the God who the wind and the waves obey. I believe that you are the God whom evil and death cannot overcome. I believe, Jesus, that our current sufferings do not compare to the glory that awaits. Can we affirm those realities in the middle of the storms? Make no mistake, Jesus is our friend. He is our companion. He is our teacher. But Mark 4 proclaims to us that Jesus is also our God, our Lord, that his power cannot be matched. Who is this man? Mark 4 proclaims to us today, He is Lord and He is God. In the storms that we experience, when the waves are crashing over, when it seems like we don't know if we're going to live or die, can our hearts affirm this power even if the storm is ongoing? And let me put it another way to you this morning. Do you believe that the power, do you believe in the power of Jesus? To the degree that part of you is afraid of him. I'm going to ask that question again because I think it's a really important question. Do you believe in the power of Jesus to the degree that part of you is afraid of him? How many of you have read this book or seen this movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Many of you. Great. Great. Uh, There's a book and a movie called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's written by C.S. Lewis. And in this story, there's a lion character named Aslan. Aslan in the story is the Christ figure. There's a scene in the movie when the two human characters, Susan and Lucy and, and their brothers and sisters, are talking to Mr. and Mrs. Beaver about Aslan. And they ask the beavers about Aslan Is he quite safe? And Mr. Beaver responds, Is he safe? 
course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Have we made Jesus too safe? Too human? Too nice? Have we made Jesus into somebody who can't really do much about the storms that we experience? I don't know how many of you noticed what comes after this story in Mark 4, but Mark 5, there are a few more really interesting and beautiful miracles that happen. Mark 5 begins with the healing of a demon-possessed man, not just with one demon, but entire legion of demons that nobody can do anything about. Right after that story, in, in verse 21 of chapter 5, we see Jesus healing a sick woman who had been sick for 12 years that no physician could do anything about. And then, after people laugh at Jesus, Jesus goes and raises a young girl from the dead. And so what we have in Mark 4 and 5 is a sequence of stories that build on each other. The calming of the storm, the casting of an entire legion of demons, the healing of a sick woman, and raising a girl from the dead. Jesus, in a little more than one chapter, exercises power over creation, over evil, over sickness, and then over death. And so Mark is declaring to us in story form Jesus' power is greater than any force we face. People of God, do we believe this? Do we believe this? Once again, I want to communicate again. This story is not about promising to us as followers of Jesus that Jesus will deliver us from all of the storms that we experience. But this story is a promise and a call for us to trust a Savior that can deliver us through our storms. By the way, this morning, do you remember how the disciples end up in the water with Jesus in the first place? Verse 35, Jesus says, let's go over to the other side. And it begs the question, did Jesus know that they were going to experience this storm? Did Jesus intentionally lead the disciples into this storm that scared them, that threatened them, that exposed their lack of faith? The story doesn't say whether Jesus knew or didn't know, but it's clear that Jesus did not keep them from experiencing the storm. In a book called Preaching to a Postmodern World, the author talks about this story in Luke 4, and the author states that in the power of Jesus, the disciples met somebody more frightening than anybody they had met in nature, anything they had met in nature, and asks this question. Why would men invent a God whose holiness was more terrifying than the forces of nature that provoked them to invent God in the first place? We can understand men inventing an unholy God, a God who only brought comfort, but why a God more scary than earthquake, earthquake, flood, or disease? The answer to me is simple. This Jesus, this God, wasn't invented. He is real. He is far, and he is far more powerful than our hearts make him. Jesus is more powerful than all the forces of creation, more powerful than a legion of demons, more powerful than sickness and disease, more powerful even than death. Even death on a cross. This God says to the wind and the waves, peace be still. And this same God looks directly at us and asks us, why are you still so afraid? Do you have no faith? Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we acknowledge our lack of faith. We acknowledge that we don't understand why you don't simply deliver us from all the struggles that we experience. We don't understand why you won't use your power in that way, in the ways that we want. We don't understand why it seems like sometimes you don't care 
and why you don't do something. We thank you for this beautiful story. And we pray that our faith in your power would be strengthened. We pray that our belief in who you are and what you are able to do be so strong that we can endure any storm, whether you quiet the waves or not. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.